everyone. Good evening. It's so nice to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Dr. Linda White Ryan, and I am the Dean of Students here at GSS. Um, I oversee student services for all of the campuses, both online and on campus. And I am here to tell you that I just received an emergency message from Dr. Ball that there was a school crisis and he is running um, almost 15 minutes late. So therefore, I want to apologize, but I didn't want to keep you all sitting in the waiting room. Um, school social work is quite, a, it can be crisis oriented. And I will share with you that um, many students say to me, you know, Dean White Ryan, I really would like to be a school social worker. There's a lot of interest in school social work. And I must tell you that usually up until this point in time, there's one or two social work positions in each school. So that even though so many students are interested in becoming school social workers, there are not often many jobs available. The Department of Education, however, due to COVID and the need for families and children to have uh, mental health services and social work services, has just hired 500 new social workers. And um, Dr. Ball will explain to you that he oversees all the social workers in New York City in the Department of Education. And he actually has many positions available. So he will talk to you more about that. But if you are interested in becoming a school social worker, I am here to tell you that this is a great time to be able to do that at this point in time. So it is a sought after um, social work position. And if you're interested, now is the time. So what I'd like to do is take a moment. I'm going to read Dr. Ball's bio now um, so that when he gets here, he will be able to just jump in. And um, after I read the bio, if any of you have any questions for me, not as much about school social work, but I am, um, as I said, I oversee student services, any questions about the program, any questions about clinical work. I'm an LCSW, I'm also a psychiatric nurse. Um, and so I have a lot of experience in the field and I'm happy to answer any questions to fill in the gap till Dr. Boyle gets here. So I'm going to start by reading Dr. Bull's bio. So this is an introduction for my colleague and my very good friend, Dr. Roger Bull, who has been a friend, such a good friend to Fordham GSS, to the students, but also to us throughout the program. He is always here for us. So Dr. Bull is a clinical social worker, licensed in New York State for over 20 years. He works within the New York City Department of Education as the supervisor of all social workers for the borough of the Bronx. In this role, he and his borough-wide team provide a variety of support and resources to schools across the city, including crisis intervention, which is the reason that Dr. Ball is late tonight because there was a crisis. Um, training and development. So he does a lot of training for the social workers that work in the New York school, school um, New York City school system in the Bronx. Um, also, he'll talk to you more about it. There are many internships. Dr. Paul has many of our students as interns in the Bronx, and he has personally supervised so many of our social work interns um, that are interested in becoming school social workers. He also works with the social workers throughout the Department of Education to provide community resources. He'll tell you a little bit about his story, how he got interested in when he became a school social worker in the needs of the children and the community surrounding the areas in the Bronx and how he just sort of jumped in and created all kinds of miracles to help the surrounding communities. Um, he also works on, as a supervisor, he works on building internal capacity um, for the school systems. And um, 
expanding in uh, expanding internship opportunities through partnerships with um, colleges and universities. So not only with Fordham, but many of the other social work uh, programs throughout um, the Bronx. He has provided many, many opportunities for student interns, and he has personally overseen them. He can't do it all now, but um, lot, he has had many, many students there and still does. Other positions that Dr. Ball has held, and this speaks, I think, directly to his very rich past experience. Um, he's been a program director for the African American Male Initiative of the Children's Aid Society. He was also a project director of Project LEAP, which is uh, a drug abuse prevention program within the Archdiocese of New York. He's been an adjunct professor at New York Theological Seminary and uh, Concordia College, Mercy College and Monroe College. He currently, at this point in time, teaches at Lehman College in the BASW program, as well as at Fordham University. He has taught with us for many years and uh, for the past 12 years. And I am here to tell you that he is extremely sought after. His classes fill up in, <laughs> in minutes and the students love him. And he teaches on campus. Of course, now a lot of the classes he's taught, like all of us, are virtual. But if you see Dr. Roger Ball on the last day of class, you walk by his classroom when we were on campus and he is having a feast in his classroom for students and celebrating the semester, their achievement um, and, and the students love him. <laughs> so um, he earned his doctorate from Fordham University's Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education. Um, and he had a concentration in marriage and family life. He also has two master's degrees, one in social work and the other in religious uh, education. Both actually he um, also acquired here at Fordham University. He has pu published two books. The first one, which I have personally read is uh, called, the, that was a few years ago, it was 2019, uh, called The Ties That Bind and Bruise. His, and it's about families. And the second book um, that is a, was just recently released is called Deconstructing uh, Love. And it focuses on singles and managing successful, meaningful relationships. He's a very sought after motivational speaker and facilitator of workshops um, for conferences, retreats, and camps. He serves as a board member for the Academy Charter School and Sacred Call Ministries. He is also the board chairman and executive pastor of Family, Work, Family Worship Center of the Family Worship Center in the Bronx, where he previously served as the senior pastor for 20 years. However, his most important and primary role vocation, as he calls it, as to, is to be a husband to his wife, Seneca, Seneca rather, and father to his four children, Jonathan, 21, Vanessa, 19, Michael, 17, and Addison, six years of age. So that is my friend, Dr. Ball. Um, as you can tell, he is quite accomplished and amazing, and he should be here with us very soon. Um, what I'm going to do before he gets here, just to, when Dr. Ball does start speaking with you, I'm going to ask you all to, now there are 80 of us here now, I'm going to ask you to hold the chats because, um, actually I disabled the chat, I'll put it back on later, but it's really distracting for the speaker and for the students sometimes to, when students are typing in questions in the chat. Uh, when it is time for questions, when he's finished, um, you can just put your hands up. I'll call on you. I will, um, I will enable the chat again, but putting your hand up, if you go to the reaction, um, the little reaction button on the bottom of the screen, and it says, put your hand up, that works really, really well, and I'm very good at managing it. So Maureen, you have a question. Hi there, thanks. 
Hi, um, Michelle. Yeah, yeah, thanks for taking my question. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, I'm in the Fordham online program, so I live not in New York and I'm working toward a school social work license here in my state. Where do One you of live, the Maureen? I live in Oregon. I'm oh, originally good. from the East Coast though, so, um, and I have a sister who lives just a few blocks from the Fordham campus, so near and dear, <laughs> near and dear, even though I'm way out here. Um, but anyway, in Oregon, we have um, to, to obtain a school social work license, we need some specific coursework. I'm sure you're familiar with for the school social work course. And then another course on educational policy. Is that something that Fordham offers as part we of We do not GSF? offer the educational policy at this point in time, but we do have school social work, as you know. And right. what I would do is get in touch with the Department of Education in Oregon to ask. They usually have some information as to where you could take that course, you'd have to take it somewhere else. Unfortunately, we don't have it at this okay. point in time. It's not something New York requires. So oh, sorry about that. Maureen. Okay, that's all right. Thanks. Yeah, but I'll be able to get the school social work course, of course. And then there's You're a few other there. requirements that fit. Great, thank you. Dr. Ball has joined us. Welcome, Dr. Paul. I have already read your bio and um, your reputation precedes you. I told them what a sought after professor you are and that your classes fill right up. Um, and so I'm so excited to have you here and we have so many students here. So um, welcome. And what I've asked the students to do is to hold questions till the end after you speak so that you can answer questions. Um, so I've disabled the chat for now and I will enable it again afterwards and students can re use the reaction button to ask questions. So welcome, Dr. Ball, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, White Ryan. I'm not even gonna try to fix my, my background, okay? So I'm no, just- No, you look beautiful, you look great. I'm going to just leave it right there. That's so, great. So good evening, everyone. And my apologies for being late. Um, I was, I cannot tell you how many uh, stop lights and signs that I went through um, to get, just to get to you, just <laughs> to get to you, right? And so it was one of those situations where um, I, I, I had to report to a school to really provide support um, to a superintendent, principal, a uh, parent uh, and a child, and I'll leave that there. So a little bit about myself beyond what might have been shared with my uh, I uh, on my bio, I'll keep it short. My primary vocation is to be a husband to Seneca Ball and a father to our four children. Uh, Jonathan, who is 21, uh, Vanessa, who is 19, uh, Michael, who is 17, and Addison, who is six years old. Um, I believe I see one of my staff. Is that Darlene uh, uh, on? I think uh, one of my staff is here. Yes, hello. Yes, and, I am. I yes, right. I'm here. So, it's Maggie. Maggie's on as well. Oh, well my, my folks. So why didn't you guys just take it and run with it? You guys could have <laughs> done the presentation. All right. So in this new role, my, my new role is supervisor um, for social workers for, for the entire borough of the Bronx. It's a really fascinating and amazing job as a social worker um, because in a way, and before that I served as an assistant principal, we really get to build the road as we travel it. We support a tremendous amount of teachers, tremendous amount of staff, principal, superintendent, executive superintendent. Um, and so this is really good work. And probably just about every other week or so, maybe every week, we're actually placing social workers in schools, right? So it, it, sort of where I sit, we get to really, principals are constantly reaching out to say, you know, we need some social workers, we need social workers, we need, you know, uh, social work interns. And so it gives us the opportunity to really support our colleagues in um, helping them to, um, uh, Linda, if you, uh, Dr. White Ryan, if you could just kindly make me a co-host, I would very much appreciate that. And I'm gonna share my screen. And I'm, there's a PowerPoint here that my 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 yes, staff. Yes, you, you are a co-host. I made you a co-host, Roger. Oh, says that it's disabled. Uh oh. 
Where's Matt? Matt, you still here? I'm still here. Okay, uh, now Roger, I see. Now, yeah. now, now I could now I could share. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just go back and look at this here. There you go. And <laughs> share my screen. There you go. Okay, so in this conversation, whilst it's loading, um, in this conversation, what I would like to do is to spend some time um, talking to us about sort of the scope um, of social work inside school systems, inside, inside public education. And the talk will include some of these pieces and I'll open it just now. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of these because I find that probably it's best that we create the space for you to ask questions, right? So I could, and I'm, I'm happy to share this PowerPoint as well afterwards if folks would like to, to get their hand on it. Okay, um, so here is an amazing opportunity. And I was sitting uh, at a, a meeting uh, today with uh, Darlene, one of my staff who is on here as well. In the conversation, we had several executive superintendents. We had many principals. We had about seven or eight principals, uh, untold assistant principals and, and other folks. And here is what we do know. In the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of times where really a tremendous amount of human sufferings we are seeing in schools. And as much as folks are trying to teach academics, here's what we know for sure. If people are not well emotionally, if they're not well mentally, if they're not whole relationally, then in a real sense, the academic right, goes through the window. And so what we do know now more than ever is that we have to take care of each other's social and emotional well-being. And so one of the things that New York City Department of Education did over the summer was that they said, we need to hire more social workers, right? We need to hire more, not only more social workers, they said they needed to hire 500 more social workers, right? I mean, I mean, think about that. Non-for-profit organizations and CBOs and clinics are all crying bloody murder. Why? Because a lot of the social workers are jumping from those agencies to public education. And one of the reasons for that is because historically when a social worker goes into a school, they stay there until they retire uh, for all kinds of reasons. And so with all the influx of new social workers, um, a lot of social service agencies started losing their social workers. What I wanna to talk to you a little bit about this evening is one, um, the scope of social workers inside schools in public education and the different paths that you can take. I'll also talk about the scope of the work, what it looks like on the ground. And then I'll also spend a little time talking to you about sort of some of the benefits of social workers, uh, you know, of, of the benefits of being a social worker in school for yourself and your family, right? So the first thing that we should really think about is, and I will share this with my colleagues at Fordham so they could share it uh, with you as well. And that is the process. Nobody, right? No principal, doesn't matter how amazing they, you know, they think you are, doesn't matter, you know, how gifted and talented you are. No principal can or would be able to hire you if you do not have the proper certification, right? And that is not a certification that comes from New York City, doesn't come from Westchester government, doesn't come from, right? If, and I'm speaking specifically here of New York State. You have to get your certification to New York State. And there's a three page document that we'll share with you that has the entire process from start to finish. So that's one thing. You have to go through the process of getting your certification and that is simple. And sometimes students mistake your, cert your state certification to be a school social worker with Sometimes they're mistaking it with your LMSW, right? You do not need, I see some of my, I see quite a few of my students on here already as, as well. Um, I say, hey, Chloe, I see you right there. I see, I see, I'm not gonna start calling names. I see a lot, lots and lots of my students, including some former students as well. Um, 
So one, you definitely, you know, I'm so don't confuse that with getting an LMSW. In fact, you can become a school social worker without your LMSW, but eventually they will require it, right? Eventually they will require your LMSW, but for the first four or so years, you actually don't need it. What they need is your master's, they, they, right? You need the, the, the credit. And so here are the things that you need. One, you need your, you know, your, to submit your fingerprints to the state website, teach.gov, uh, I believe it is, right? And again, we have the resource here. You need your, uh, your work history, yes, demographical stuff. You need uh, three workshops. You need the violence prevention workshop. You need the child abuse prevention workshop. And you need what the latest one that they had about seven years ago, you need the DASA, right? That's a bullying prevention workshop. So those are the three workshops that you need, right? So you need your fingerprints, you need a transcript, you need your demographical information, and you need those three workshops. Once you've submit those to the state. You were, yeah. Go ahead. Can you repeat ahead. those three workshops, yeah, Roger? Sure. Um, you need, and maybe one of my brilliant students could, could throw them in the chat as well. You need your, the DASA, the Dignity for All workshop. You need your violence prevention workshop and you need your child abuse workshop, right? And I don't know if Fordham offer all three, uh, Dr. Linda White Ryan, if so, you could just you know, let us know, but lots of colleges and universities and agencies, the UFT, like all the, these are offered all over the place and they're sort of like four hour workshops, you have to pay for them. And wherever you take them, you tell them to send it to the state, right? So you should create your, your account in the state and the state website and then they will just ship them or you know, they'll electronically send them to the state, right? So that's essentially what you need. And then, and then you need patience, right? And then you need patience. And the reason for that is there's just so much backlogging, you know, that's take, gridlocking that's taking place at the state level and, and even in the city level that you want to do, start and uh, you, you want to start your application, especially if you're graduating or if you've graduated, start now. Please do not wait. I cannot tell you how many social workers I could have hired, literally, right? I mean, just imagine, and, and I support 365 schools, right? 365 schools. And beside the 500 positions that they're hiring, some schools have enough money. Many schools have had enough money to say, we wanna bring in more social workers in our building. And so I've just been placing social workers, even just yesterday, um, Friday, I was able to you know, place the social workers. And, many before, some inside who wants to move around and some outside who are trying to get into the, into the DOE. So that's probably, I'm going to tell you, that is your biggest obstacle. It is the number one obstacle. If you don't do that, don't even apply, don't go to the city and, and fill out any application, nobody can touch it. Nobody could give you a job as a social worker if you do not have your state certification. It's, and it's just paperwork stuff. But they, are we good with that? Can I just maybe go on? Yeah, okay. that sounds great. All right, so that's the important um, piece of it. And then let me continue. Oh, let's see, there you go. Um, so what are some, um, some of the categories of, of social work, you know, of, of roles that social workers play in, in schools? There's essentially, a, a few kinds of social workers. And I'm, going to, I'm just gonna name them. There's what they refer to as a related service providers. And then there are those who are part of the school-based support team. And then I'll go over the others. So these two, right? First, the related service providers are social workers who are part of the school, individual schools that are hired to provide mandated counseling. I don't like that term mandated, but it simply means that a child has an IEP another acronym, Individualized Education Plan, a special education designation, and therefore on their special education de designation or the IEP, it may say so, um, counseling services once a week in individual, once a week in group. And so the social worker or, and or a guidance counselor would provide those services, right? 
other things you're doing is at risk, you know, parent workshops, you know, some of those de escalation supporting kids as well. The other one is what is referred to as, you know, your school based support team. Now, this social worker works exclusively almost with the formulations of IEPs, right? Individualized education plans. So let's say little Johnny is discovered to have possibly have some form of, you know, um, intellectual disabilities or some delays, cognitive delays, or in some cases, you know, what they refer to as emotionally disturbed and they need to get special education designation for smaller class sizes and or some counseling services. This social worker would be the one that really meet with parents, do the, so, the biopsychosocial assessment. The other social worker would not do that. They only provide direct services to students. This social worker, the school-based support team social worker, what they're doing is that they are supporting in the writing of the initial IEPs and then, you know, and then maybe updates later on. So I'll give you an example. Today I had an email from a social worker that's inside the DOE who said, who actually was just hired right? They were hired thinking that they were going to be this social worker providing ongoing support to students and families and, you know, all that kind of work. But it turned out that the position that she was hired for was this position, right? Right. And that's just, it's all paperwork, right? It's all paperwork. So very little interactions with children and the day-to-day -day grind of a school. So the social worker said, I thought I was going to be a uh, you know, interviewed for the related service position, but they put me on the school-based support team. In fact, one of my staff here, Meg Walsh, was a, was part of the school-based support team for about eight years before she joined my team. And so th those are the two primary school-based social workers. There's one more that I should add in there, and that is for the, the STH or student intent. By the way, the deal will kill you with acronyms, just so you know, right? Is this STH, student in temporary housing social worker, right? And the student in temporary housing social worker, they work exclusively with students who are living some form of temporary housing situation. Most public schools that you walk in, into in the Bronx, between, between 25 to 35% of students live in some form of public housing, some form of temporary shelter system, right? Um, um, and that's just the harsh reality of children that lives in the Bronx. So those are three types of social workers that I just um, talk about. And then there's college and career readiness. And then if you look at the bottom here, we have the borough and central social workers, right? So um, for example, my team is a borough-wide team, right? And that's a newly constructed team. So we provide uh, crisis interventions across the entire borough. A child dies in front of the school. A beloved teacher passes away. You know, some a child is assaulted. Someone, I, I mean, I, I don't wanna get into all the bad things, but just about every day I get a text message about the place where I have to deploy my team uh, for them and for us to go on to deal with crises, including this morning. So that's the borough team. And then the central team, by central we mean they work down at Tui down someplace in, in, in the city, and they may provide more training and development for schools. They may provide more training and development for schools. Now, someone may be asking about salary. Does the salary vary? Not really. And the reason for that is because social workers, the, your, your, your salary line is a part of the, it falls under collective bargaining under the United Federations of Teachers. So it's not the position that you have, it's really the number of years that you have, right? So I'll get to that a little bit later. Now, if you are um, aspirational beyond being a social worker, there are plenty of opportunities for you to go other routes as well, eventually, right? So you could, with your, your SBL, your school-based license, or your SDL, your school district license, um, you, could, uh, you could do a lot of other things. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. There are other things that you can do. You can, you can become an assistant principal like myself, right? So I became an assistant principal for the last almost five years I've been an assistant principal. You could uh, work with special education department as an educational administrators. 
You could eventually become a principal if that's what you want, a superintendent. I mean, you could do, you know, and so there are lots of other managerial positions within public education that are good for social workers. Now, I'm, I'm gonna be very transparent with you that these positions here, this is my smart goal worksheet, by the way, from one of my classes that keeps popping up there. Um, these positions that, I, that I'm talking about here, so for all those people who tell you you should not go into social work because social workers do not make any money. I'm here to let you know that if you become, let's say, an administrator, you're talking, well, don't you all get excited all of a sudden now? Right? You're talking six-figure salary, right? You're talking starting maybe at a hundred and ten, hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, right? Um, in 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 those in those EA uh, position, educational administrators position, right? Now, don't you all abandon the other good work that needs to take place, right? Uh, we still need you in the trenches, right? Still need you to take one for the team. Right. Um, so, so those are some of the possible pathways that you can take. Um, the Castle framework is what most schools are using today to really provide, and you should look it up. You should look up, you know, castle.org. Um, the Castle framework is what's being used to do a lot of the SEL, the social and emotional uh, work across the city and, other, and, and, and around the country. And these are the five core components that we work with children on. Um, Self-management, responsible decision-making, relationships, social awareness, and self-awareness. I love this because what it does, it talks to you all about what kids need to do, what kids need to do, what you need to work on with kids. But I think that a big part of the work is what adults need to work on as well if they're going to support children. Won't spend much time on that. So let me invite you then to reflect, and I really wanna leave ample time for you to really force to have a conversation. So if I'm going a little fast is because I, I want to get rid of the PowerPoint so that we could talk. So here's a more recent um, theoretical underpinning our approach that we've been employing in public education, MTSS, multi-tiered uh, system of support. And essentially what we're saying is that students in our buildings may come in at different space, a different place based on their social and emotional need. The same thing is true, by the way, for academics. And so if you think of this tiered approach and maybe uh, I may, and maybe if you could just pull the triangle from off um, the internet and drop it. Oh, the chat has been disabled. Well, when it's when it's enabled, maybe you could throw it in for me. Um, the uh, the, the um, RTI um, triangle, maybe you could just drop it in the chat for me later on once it's enabled. And that is that at the bottom of the triangle, most people, most children will have some sort of universal support like for example, some form of SEL curriculum that all the kids are getting, advisory, recess, some PBIS support that all the children are participating in. So that's sort of the broadest support, right? All kids get an education, all kids get ELA, all kids get math, all kids get lunch and all kids get recess and all kids get some form of curriculum, harmony, Yale's ruler program, or you know, urban um, assembly, uh, the four R's or so, something like that. So that's sort of your foundational. And here's the thing that you need to know about that. If the foundation is strong, the next two tiers up, you're gonna need to do less work. If your foundation is weak, and there's not enough support and infrastructure down below at the base of this triangle, then the upper base of the triangle is gonna be bigger, right? So tier two is sort of the next block of the same triangle. So if you imagine cutting the triangle in three, so tier two would be sort of some at-risk counseling, some parent meeting, some support along the way, right? It's not the, the top of the, the, the triangle. And then tier three is sort of when the place is on fire, right? When like like really there's not enough support there. And so you need to do things like IEP referrals. You need to do day intensive day treatment program. You need to have one-on-one -on -one counseling, right? The child may not, may, you know, may need some form of hospitalization, so on and so forth. So 
those in a way are the, 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 the tiered support. Social workers are doing attendance support. One of, one of the things that we see, for example, is that I believe in, I'm a man of the community, right? Like I'm not that social worker that got, that, lock, that ever was, you know, pull kids in my office and sit there and say, how is your day? What are you going on working on whatever trauma they're having? I fundamentally believe in being fully embedded in the life of the community, right? Helping to do professional development with teachers and supporting the hallways and redirecting children and bringing in resources for families. Social workers in schools have historically not been utilized most effectively. It's an orientation that I came to public education with from my work in the community in the non-for-profit world, that you need to be fully, and even my social work interns and Darlene was, was one of my social work interns back in 2013. Um, and that what we really did was we, we supported the school holistically, right? And so, um, for example, right now, even though no one says it's a part of our job descriptions, here's my belief. If we cannot find kids, if kids are not showing up for school, if they are being traumatized over these last two years, we could say, let's do the minimum. Let's make a call. Let's call ACS. Let's send a letter home and let's leave it at that. Boom, our job is done. I don't believe that because if it was my kid, if it was my kin, I would want somebody to go out in the community and to find them, right? And to find them. And so I readily, whether I was a, an assistant principal or now we go and we knock on doors and we say to them, we have not seen you in a while, right? Your school have not seen you. And, and what I do to push my schools is I say to my team, don't go by yourself. I ask the school to send one of their counselors. Remember, I'm sort of borough wide. So we, we're not going there alone. Bring them along. Not that we can't, but the kid would know somebody's face from the school, right? So it's not strangers knocking on their doors. Um, and so we would go in and provide some support for them. Referrals to intensive day treatment programs, referrals to community services, um, so on and so forth are some of the work that we're doing. Um, I'm just going to think I have a couple more slides. Um, family engagement. So here are some of the things that really excite me. Once again, if you talk about sort of work that and it far outpaces this. Um, for example, tomorrow I'm having my staff, you know, attend a workshop that will you know, share with them some day treatment programs. Um, my, my staff has been, you know, knocking on doors with, in terms of clinics and CBO, non-for-profit organizations, forming partnerships so that school social workers and principals and assistant principals and parent coordinators, that they have resources in the community. Um, Dr. Linda White Ryan we may remember when we taught the human behavior course, there was this culminating project that was called sort of the community or neighborhood assessment. And students had to comb every resources in the community and know them. And it's like a 25, 30 page paper. That, um, I thought it was one of the most effective papers in teaching some policies and teaching students how to really get to know the community, right? And so these are some of the things that we do. And look at number two. And I'm gonna stop sharing because it excites me so much. Number two excites me and I'll tell you why. It excites me because over the last two years, we have, and I see, I see Kevin. Oh, Kevin, I didn't realize you're on here too. Kevin McKnight, just so you guys know, Kevin is, was one of my students at Fordham and Kevin is now a social worker in one of our schools in the Bronx. Maybe this is a good time for me to say this. Five of my current staff are former, either my former students or my former social work interns. Now, I never miss an opportunity. And so what's the, what am I saying here? You're always being interviewed. And the social work field is a very small field. So whether you were an intern you are being interviewed. Whether you are a student in my class or Dr. Linda White Ryan's class, um, you're always on an interview and it's critically important. And so how you show up 
in these spaces matters, right? How you show up in these spaces matters. Um, when I was gonna become an assistant principal, one of my social work interns, I convinced Hunter College, sorry, um, to let her stay with me for two years, right? Convince them to, I'll diversify her work, but let her stay with me for two years because at the end of that two years, I'm leaving and I want her to have my job, right? I want her to take, and, and we created a pathway that did exactly that. Six years later, I went back for her. <laughs> Six years later, I went back and said, now I want for you to come and join my team at the borough level. And so that's what we did. So one of the things that truly excites me is this. No one said it was a part of our job. No one said it was in my job description, but I formed a partnership with the Food Bank of New York. And over two years, over the, during this pandemic, probably 56 schools or so, I, and I, I, we should have really included some of those slides in, in, you know, pictures in this slide. You would have to imagine this, pallets, talking 12, 13 pallets, that's, that's you know, taller than I am, that covers an entire block with hundreds and hundreds of people lined up around the school hundreds of people getting food, boxes of fresh fruits and vegetables. And we repeated that over and over and over and over again throughout the Bronx. And I said to them, that's good, but it's not what I really want. What I really want is this, that every single school in New York City, every single school in New York City that has a need for a food pantry, that we want to establish one. So I'm talking to the politician, I'm talking to executive superintendent, and when I get in front of the chancellor, which I will, I'm gonna tell her or whoever the new chancellor may or may not be, I'm gonna tell them that this is something that we need to do. And so we have put in about seven or eight um, pantries, permanent pantries, not just the pop-ups, but permanent pantries where parents are able to come into schools on a weekly basis. Last week, we just, establish one of the latest one in one of our schools in the Bronx. So those are the things that really excite me as well in really forming new partnerships. And the good thing is that when your job is new, you really get the opportunity to do whatever you think is best. All right, so I'm definitely not talking to you about the number of hours that you need to work because I was working until, <laughs> until late this evening um, in a school. Um, so here's what I wanna talk to you about. I want to talk to you about money and then I'm going to end it there. So the starting salary, I'm just going to go to the last slide. The starting salary for a current New York City public school social worker fresh out of grad school is about $72,000. Throw your hands up if you're ready to go. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> ready, you ready? Are you ready? All right, so, so that's the starting salary, right? And, and I'm talking 10 months, right? I'm talking 10 months. Actually, not even quite 10 months because by the time you throw in the, all the holidays in there, it may amount to about nine months or something like that, right? So, and if you want to work per session, which is um, over time, so to speak, it's about $54 per hour per session. So for example, I could tell you one of my staff, there's a after school program that they're looking for a social worker to provide support for a youngster in an after school program. And so I was able to connect one of my staff to that after school program and they tell them you could do as many hours as you want. Um, and so you're talking a good maybe four or $500 extra a week on top of the, the regular paycheck. Benefit, health insurance, if you you know, need your health insurance benefit, you're starting a family, you need health care for you know, your, your, your loved ones. Um, I pay little to nothing for health insurance. Um, my kids, I, it's fascinating. I, you know, at this point I have almost grown kids and you know, they, they just, you know, they, go about their business, they go to their own doctor's appointment, and you know, every now and then one of them misplaced their cards, and they said, Dad, can you send me a picture of your card? And I really paused, and I think about it. I said, they, you know, there's no even thought for them um, that, you know, what if we didn't have health care? What if we, right? There's, there's no question. They pick their doctors, and they simply go wherever they want to go. So those are some of the real benefits. Those are some of the great benefits of being a social worker. I'm going to stop there. Um, and uh, take any questions. Let me just see if there's anything salient 
that I would want to go over. No, nope. and we're going. That, that that was really it. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. White Ryan if you can. Yep, I will manage the questions. So if you just go to the little reaction button on the bottom of the screen and put your hand up, Tanisha is the first question, the first hand that I see. Hi, Tanisha. Hi, Dr. Ryan. How are you? Good, good. You have a question for Dr. Ball? Yes, I do. So um, I'm currently I'm currently a DOE employee. Um, I'm a paraprofessional that yeah. is transitioning into being a social worker. Um, I applied for the provisional license. So I'm just waiting. Nice. I asked about the benefits, though. I'm not sure if with my provisional license, do I still get my benefits, like the health insurance? Like that doesn't change. You get everything. So okay. provisional, just so you know, provisional has the provisional just simply means, right? Provisional, interestingly, it's kind of coincide with just about the time that you would get your tenure, right? Okay. So okay. provisional coincide for I think like four years or something like that. I could be yeah. wrong in a while for me now, but it coincides with your and so your tenure after your social worker, you get the same way a teacher get tenure you know, and mid administrator gets tenure, you as a social worker get tenure. So your provisional coincide with your tenure year. And once you've gotten your tenure, you apply again for your permanent certification. And that exactly. simply means that you are a permanent social worker and you have your tenure, you're set for life. You have to do something awful. And I, you know, I mean, awful. You have to like steal money from the DOE. You have to, I, there are certain things that the DOE will can you for, right? And I'm right. being honest, right? Stealing money, stealing time, and inappropriate behaviors with children. Those are the things that they will terminate you for. Otherwise from that, but in terms of provisional, it has absolutely no bearings on all of your benefits. You get all of your benefits as, you know, you know uh, whether or not you have your permanent certification. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Christina. Thank you. Hi, um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I was hoping um, that you might be able to speak to the role that a social, a social worker might play in an education district with regard to education policy and education curriculum. Um, I've been working with some kind of grassroots efforts in my own community. I'm upstate New York. I'm in Orange County. Okay. Um, and we've been educating ourselves and trying to educate others about the New York State CRS curriculum initiative and, um, you know, presenting to our school board about diversity, equity, and inclusion yeah. and, you know, curriculum reform, um, you know, to basically make sure that our school curriculums represent all students. Um, do you think that there's a place, I'm sorry for my dog, um, do you think that there's a place for social workers in policy, in education policy at higher levels in order to um, work towards this change? That's a great question. And for all of my students in this room, you know, when I talk about my soapbox, you know exactly what happens, right? Then I become sermonic, right? Then I start, you know, you know, proclaiming. Um, and so the, the short answer is absolutely, right? I have sat historically, and I think I have a text here. Uh, one swift recommendation for you is Goldie Muhammad's book, Cultivating Genius, if you, if you don't know that resources. And here's what, here's the problem. The problem is that the curricula, plural, were not written with oftentimes students of color in it. That's the first thing. Secondly, the curricula were not written with the social and emotional in there, right? Teachers and educators for a very long time have really believed that if you're teaching math, you're simply teaching math. Well, it actually turns out that math is a part of culture. Math is a part of language. Math is a part of heritage. Math is a part of, you know, part of a, the very essence of who we are as human beings. And this notion of teaching something in a vacuum does not exist and it has never existed. And those who try to do it, what they've only done is succeeded in isolating black and brown children or really isolating, you know, as Terence, the great African philosopher says, I am human 
and there's nothing that's human that is alien to me, right? And so in other words, we have to embed the culture, the language, the music, right? The heritage, the food, right? All the history, all of those things, because when we, and when I was teaching at the Fordham campus, I used to, you know, say to my students, I used to crack open the door and talk to myself. I used to say, now language, now culture, now biases, now gender, now socioeconomics. I need you to stay outside because I'm going into the classroom or into a counseling session. And when I'm done with this session, then I'm going to call it all of you to say, come, let's go back together. You can. We don't bifurcate or separate ourselves. So I would say, I'm glad that you're looking at you know, the work that New York State is doing. I'm glad that you, and, and I'm happy to share some, some, some resources as, as well. Um, uh, Chris Emden um, wrote a book. Um, I, I forgot the, the exact title, but some strange title. I have it around here as well. It's something that goes like, you know, um, you know, teaching in the hoods for all you white folks, right? Something to that effect. And Chris Emden, I know him, know him well. Um, so, so yeah, so you, you, you have to. So one, I would say, be familiar with the literature. Two, look for opportunities. Like I sit on, you know, citywide and district-wide equity teams and conversations, but here's the truth of the matter. What they continue to do is to say, take the curriculum and try to, you know, squeeze the kids' lives into the curriculum. Nonsense, right? Teachers, nonsense. What they need to do is to dismantle it altogether and recreate it so that the students' voice are present. I, I promise you, so long as they try to beg teachers to put the kids' life, lived experience in it, it's going to fail. They need to reimagine curriculum. And I promise the next question, I'll answer it much in much shorter time. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Roger you. Amore. You're next. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dean White Ryan and and Dr. Ball. Uh, nice to meet you virtually. Uh, so my name is Amari Espinal, and um, I have a few questions, but I'll narrow it down. Um, so I'm uh, as of fairly recently, just about a year in an administrative role, um, and I've worked last seven years almost exclusively with veterans and veteran families um you know working uh, uh with the city in conjunction with a few other city agencies so uh, my question is what are some uh experiences or sort of you know i know we we discussed some of the certifications but what what are some things that uh, the doe would like to see on our resume or hear about mm, um, that's a really good may question. want to go into administrative or a you know frontline uh position of the doe well let's Let's talk about, let's talk about, let, let's, since most people on here would be coming social worker, let's talk about social work, right? So here are the things that I would say for you to know, right? And I, and, and, and I've really been, I'm very serious about this. I've really been prepping, you know, my junior colleagues for these interviews because here's what I, here's what I tell them. If you could, um, Sarah, um, if you could just move. Oh. <laughs> Sarah Moriba, if you could just mute, please. Um, Sarah, can you please mute? Thank you. So here is what I say to my junior colleagues. I can get you in the room, but I can't get you the job, right? Um, and I'm saying that for a reason, right? I'm saying that for a reason, because you need to prepare yourself for the interview, right? Like, you know, put on a bow tie. No, don't put on a bow tie if you're not a bow tie, you know, kind of person. <laughs> but here's what you do. You need to know the school demographics. You need to know the percentage of kids in the school that have IEPs. It's public information. You need to know their attendance, right? You need to know their suspension rate. You need to know the CBO that they work with. You need to know the potential CBO that they can work with, right? You need to ask them, what are they looking for in a social worker? You need to come with your, like seriously, you have to come with your A game. Right? In, in interviewing folks from my team, I cannot tell you how many times I said, nope, nope, nope. Because the truth of the matter during this time, people are looking for the best. They're looking for people who are innovative, thoughtful, well-researched, curious, clinical, right? Like all of those things they're really looking for. So you see like what I just talked about the CASA framework? I said, know the CASA framework inside out, right? The MTSS that I just referred, know it inside out, right? 
The DOE is getting ready to do some screener, um, the DESA screener with all, with, with every single kid in New York City. I won't get into that. Know the DESA screener, right? Go on and, 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 and so like even just those three things that I just mentioned, you're applying for a school social work job are those four things, right? Know the, the, um, the, the CASO's framework. No, uh, and then with that, no couple of curriculum, right? No, a couple of SEL curriculum, the harmony, right? The, the urban assembly, the, you know, um, uh, 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 the Yale ruler program, like know some of the research-based curriculum and then you, it will go something like this. So when they ask you if you have any question, you could say, so tell me, what are some of the research-based curriculum are you using in your school that is based on the CASA framework? Ah, see, now you have their full attention, right? So the DESA, the DESA screening, the CASA framework, MTSS tiered intervention, whether it's academic attendance or SEL. So, and and, and know the school, know the school inside out, do your research. So I would say if you have those two things, if you have those things, then you have people's full attention. Thanks, Roger. Aretha is next. Yes. Good evening, everyone. A pleasure to meet you. So I wanted to know, once you attend all the workshops, do you apply for the certificate, the um, school social worker certificate? And if so, what's the following steps after? Like, do you think uh, a person has to reach out to the principal to be considered for a social worker position? Yeah. So, so, so the state certification, right? Once you submit everything that I just talked about, and I'm not gonna go it over again, but once you've submitted all of those pieces that we talked about, the next step is that the state issues you a certificate, right? The state issues you the certification. Once you have the certification or while you are waiting on the certification, you could then start applying to schools, reaching out to principals. Let me tell you what I did. I, I, I have, I'll share a little secret to you. Uh, 12 years ago when I was going into the DOE. So it's so Roger-esque of me. I found every, I went online and I looked for as many principals as I could find, their email, right? Their DOE email, right? But then I had my, my, uh, my certificate from the state. And so I wrote them a long email and I affixed my certificate to the email and I sent and I BCC'd all of them. And right, so it was dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens of principles that I just sent out, right? Wrote a nice fancy email, make sure it was edited and sent it out to them and say, I have my certificate, you know, and I would very much, you know, like to know if you're in, if you're looking for a school social worker and that, got me into the DOE. That, that's what I did. That got me into the DOE, right? So maximize your impact, reach out to as many as possible. And, and I got back a lot that says, we want a part-time, do you speak Spanish? Do you, you know, like at all of these correspondence and conversations. Um, and then I went on some interviews and I didn't get it. In fact, I was laughing today um, because I was in, in a school, I won't, you know, I'll name the school, Evander Charles High School, which is where I went to high school. A few days ago, I was sitting in the same room that I sat in, <laughs> that they get, didn't give me the job. In 2008, 2009, I sat in that same room and they didn't give me the job. So sometimes you don't get the job also, not because you just didn't perform. Sometimes they have somebody else lined up for the job and they just didn't give it to you. And you just have to keep on, you know, keep things in, you know. So, so once you have your certification, then you could, or once you've applied for it, then you could reach out to principals. But I could tell you this also, I've had principals who said, you know, promised people's job and said, I'm going to give you the job. Let's wait for your certification. Mm. Did you get it yet? No, we're still waiting. Did you get it yet? No, we're still waiting. And then the principal says, I am so sorry, but school is starting and I cannot wait for you any longer. I need to hire somebody else. I've known several people who have lost jobs because of that. Thanks, Roger. And Adam, you're next. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's Dr. Ball for having this. It's been very informative. I appreciate it. Um, my question is, you know, for someone who's a generalist, <clears throat> your student at Fordham, and who's interested in doing an internship, um, 
in this atmosphere, what is the uh, quickest and best way to go about trying to get that connection? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> that, that's, this is also one of my favorite things, right? So here's my vision, Adam. And Adam is one of my current students. I want to put 500 social work interns in schools in the Bronx come September. 500. And so I have the latitude. I have the... I have the, the platform, I don't wanna say power. I have the platform, I have the wherewithal, I have the relationships, I, I've centralized the process, Adam, right? So in other words, my office, my team would essentially, so let's say Dr. White Ryan would send your resume to me, right? My staff at, at the borough level would clear you, would get you, get you fingerprinted, clear you, meet with you, Determine, do you prefer elementary school, middle school, high school, right? Where do you live? How do we find a school that's closest to you, right? And then from there, would place you in a school. Because right now, um, Megan Darlene will tell you, we probably have about 15 schools that's on a waiting list that needs intern this year, not September, but right now. So, and because the, 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 the clearance is so backed up, I keep telling all of my colleagues, that the sooner you are able to get me those resumes to begin the clearance process, the earlier I could get social work interns in school. What I did 12 years ago to become a social worker, I'm doing the same thing now. I guess the technique work is that I'm reaching out to every single social work schools across the tri-state areas and letting them know that I would very much like them to place social work interns with me. So conversations like this is a win-win. So I just want to jump in there for a moment, um, if that's okay, just to let you know, Adam, and anyone who's interested, you, you should speak with your field um, coordinator, your field work coordinator, who is placing you, the placement coordinator, and tell them that you spoke with Dr. Ball in a workshop that he presented that you want to be a school social worker, you would love to be a school social worker under Dr. Ball. And if you don't get anywhere, then you come directly to me and I will go directly to the uh, head of the department to, because I have um, friends in high places so I can call Dr. Ball myself. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Laura, you're next. Thank you. Oh, great. So um, thank you so much for doing this, Dr. White Ryan and Dr. Ball. And in fact, I am. Yes. Um, I one recognize of, you. Yes, one of your new interns. And I'm so grateful. And I was one of those people, Dr. White Ryan, who was a real um, thorn in the side of my <laughs> placement advisor. And I held out for a long time. And I'm just, I'm so glad that I did and so grateful. So I'm at UIM working with the terrific um, administration and faculty there. And, um, you know, I had the pleasure of sitting in on several meetings already with Ms. Lawrence, our climate um, manager. And um, it's just, it's my dream internship. So it's great. So I'm really grateful. Thank you very much. I have two questions um, though. I mean, I have a million questions, but I'll only ask two right now. So one is um, obviously coming out of COVID, which obviously we're not out of COVID at all, but uh, back in school, you know, full time, face to face. Um, I see, you know, kids who left school in sixth grade and now are reappearing in eighth grade. And that's um, a, just a huge leap for them. And so I'm wondering about, um, at any developmental level, though, what's the number one priority for you, Dr. Ball, um, in terms of how to address that, um, and I'll just call it a gap, that, you know, social gap that's taken place um, over the past, we'll call it, you know, 18 months or so? Yeah. So I ask the second question. Let me see if I could collapse both. Okay, so the second question, actually, yeah, I guess they are related in a way. The second question is related to everything. I'm just wondering about um, the level of autonomy that a school social worker can have and um, sort of their um, authority or, or, yeah, autonomy to bring in 
programs, initiatives, et cetera, into their school? The boundaries, I'll take the latter first. The boundaries of that really depends on you and, um, and your level of in, you know, in, uh, initiative. And most principals are supportive of that. When I was a social worker, I, you know, I drove the SEL work in my building. I didn't leave it up to the principal. I drove that from start to finish, including bringing in social work intern. That was a vision I started 12 years ago. That is now, they've recognized it. And I'll tell you on this call, that my position that has been created by the city is one of me in every borough. And it's a work that I did 12 years ago that I started that there says, oh, interns, intern programs. And they wrote it in the job description. And I'll give you a little joke about that. One of my counterparts from another borough, won't say where, I called me up and said, I need to talk to you. I said, what's up? They said, we reach out to a college about getting interns and the college told us that they have that on agreement with you already. Um, and so I beat all of them to the punches, right? And so, um, you know, and so, you know, you could do it, right? I think a lot of times our sense of our own personal power, our personal driving our career, driving the scope of our work and how much autonomy we have, that's really a, more often not based on, you know, like you could ask Dr. White Ryan, nobody ever told me that I could or I couldn't bring food on campus. But every semester, I would have a potluck at the end of the semester with my students. It became the talk of the town. You could smell it a mile away down the hallway. That's something that we wanted to do to create a community. So in terms and of- I your, told them about that, Roger, before yeah. you got here. <laughs> okay. in, terms of, in terms of your first question, around the pressing priority, I try not to sort of use hierarchical language because oftentimes multiple things are simultaneously important. But here's what I would say. The number one thing that prevent bad things from happening, suicide, depression, dropout, school failures, all of those things. And to juxtapose that to what you just said, and that is that kids have missed two years of school. For you and I, it seemed like around the corner, but for children, that's almost a lifetime. And all the crisis and the trauma that went with those two years. Here's what we do know. The number one things, you could talk about all of your theoretical, and I usually tell my students, I could talk theory at two o'clock in the morning, right? I could talk it. I could talk it until I'm, you know, I'm blue in the face, which is difficult here. But here's what I can tell you. The number one thing for kids is connection. Kids who have not been in the building, who have, schools don't know children. They literally don't know them. The kids who are going to high school, we don't know them because they were last in school in, 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 uh, in seventh grade. The kids who are just leaving elementary and into middle school, we don't know them because we have not seen them before. And so that thing of standing at the door and greeting them, good morning, hey buddy, how are you doing? Tell me what's your name again? Getting to know them, this is my office. You could come you could, you could, you could come and sit and talk to me. Teachers who understand that their job is not to teach first, but to love first. And the job is not to teach first, but to love people's children first. Huh? You see, now that's not social work language, but, uh, but, but it is the truth. Kids need to be loved first to know that you care about them and to check in with them and to make them feel as though they belong and not say get out of my classroom, but the classroom belongs to them, not the teacher, right? And so make them feel as though they are somebody. And so that's the number one priority. You could call it running circles. You could call it teaching so SEL work. You could call it teaching, giving kids high five. You could talk, whatever you, I don't care what you call it, but our, the adults connecting with kids. And that's the pressing priority. Thanks, Roger. Tyrone, you're next. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Dean White Ryan. And I am a former student, for, um, Dr. Ball. Glad to meet him again. Um, I have two questions. One, as far as the certification, I just applied for my certification two weeks ago. And they mentioned one of the criteria is college supervised internship. Does, does it have to be school related or it could be any internship as long as you're doing the internship at Fordham? That's standard. That's standard in, in any school of social work. I mean, it will say it as though it's, it sits separate, but it doesn't. So whichever internship you are sitting in, 
right? Whichever internship you're sitting in, uh, Dr. White Ryan wouldn't allow you to be in there if you're not being supervised. So that's a part of the criteria. So whether you're in a hospital, whether you're in a shelter, whether you're in a school, whether you're in wherever, it doesn't matter. Once you get your master's degree, it means that you have been supervised, college supervision, and that's part of the criteria for your very graduation. So you don't need to think of that as a and you know ancillary or separate it's integral part of your in order to graduate with your social work degree you have to have your two years or whatever it's of internship so that's what they're talking about oh okay and also i have a um second question it's more of your expertise um i've noticed that with my current um job although i work in the community i noticed that um a lot of children is suffering with living around homelessness and therefore as a social worker do you think it's a good idea to partner let's say if you know that a child is currently living in a shelter with their parents although the shelter have their own requirements and time restrictions do you still think it's a good idea to partner with those shelters i don't know what you mean time restrictions for the shelter for example they have their own curfew time-wise yeah. Right, but that, okay. So, I mean, I'll answer the question broadly. So what I what I also do routinely, and I'm not just making this stuff, right? I, you know, I, I, we breathe this stuff. Um, I can tell you, you know, there's a shelter, if, you, if you're if down in the Bronx, you know, just, do you know the Whitestone Bridge just before you go over the Whitestone Bridge? For example, yes. there's a family shelter there. It's 555 Hutchinson River Drive. It's not like Dr. Seuss or something like that, right? Um, it's, once I took, I took um, bags of food for a family there during the pandemic, right? Bags of food for a family there. And you know what they told me? They said, they can't have it. I said, why not? They said, because we don't have stoves in here. Hmm. Right? Like everything, just imagine that. You can't make a cup of tea, right? Because there's no, right? Whatever, whatever is provided, you have to get it from outside. So kids who are not showing up, I go to those shelters. I look for all my kids that are in those in a particular cluster. And the deal we usually have a representative there. And so I go and I sit down with those people and the shelter coordinator and the shelter, some of the shelter systems have really bad Wi-Fi. So we partnered with non-for-profit organizations and our CBO partners, and we got Wi-Fi during the pandemic so that every single kid, when I was an assistant principal, so every single kid in my building had a computer and had you know Wi-Fi access. So the answer is yes. I, I talk to everybody. I partner with every and I I, I I believe in partnership. So so absolutely, I believe in definitely in partnering with those folks because sometimes those folks know the story that you don't. And you're if you could connect with them, they're able to help you to connect with their families as well. Thank you. Last yeah, question, Mariana. Yeah, I was gonna do a time check. Yeah, we're, this is the last question. Mariana, you're last but not least. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to be here. I apologize. I'm in the car right now, and my kid is in the back, so you might hear um, some crying. Um, but I have two questions for Dr. Ball. Um, so I'm currently a family worker within the DOE. Yeah. So I do work for the school-based assessment team. Uh, and the school psychologist I work with, she always tells me, you know, you should do the bilingual track because um, I'm Armenian, but I also speak I, I haven't met any Armenian speaking social workers, but I also understand Russian and I know that's common. Uh, so I wanted to ask, is there like a separate license or um, certificate rather that I have to get? The and the second question. Sorry. Yep. Uh, and the second question I wanted to know is do you teach online courses? Yeah, I teach at Fordham. <laughs> we didn't No, we didn't. I know, but I, I heard that you do campus. I wasn't sure if you also have online. Oh, I, well, right now I'm only teaching online. I'm only teaching oh, online because of- But that. not in the online program. Dr. Bull is an on-campus professor and he's teaching virtually. So um, oh. because, of, because a lot of our on-campus courses have become virtual, but he doesn't teach online, he teaches virtually and I'm not giving him up on campus for anything. <laughs> okay, understood. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and thank you for the clarification, uh, Dr. Weiser Ryan. Um, and can I just pause here to say how much I love my Fordham family. 
right? My PhD is from Fordham and I, I did my MSW at Fordham and I just love my Fordham family. I really do um, and over these many years. So in short, you need, there's some, there's some coursework that's required and I believe a test that's required. There is a test that's required and some coursework that's required for your bilingual extension. Um, Armenian and Russian, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure of, you know, Russian and Armenian, you know, cluster community in the Bronx. I don't know where you may want to work, but um, it may help, but I, I cannot say for sure how handy though that extension would, would, would come into for those particular languages. But I could tell you that any, any extension is a good thing. Um, but right now, you, you, right now, you know, your next move is not the extension. Your next move is your certification. And I, I can thank you. I've seen them just redeploy to communities where um, they do have that need. And so they may ask you to travel throughout the city. Um, yeah, so you, you would be hired. Um, maybe not in a community that speaks that language, but then you'd be utilized throughout the city as needed if it's a, if it's, um, if they don't have many other people filling that line. Dr. Oh, Dr. White Ryan, can, can I just have my, my, both of my staff just say something before we Oh, go? of course, uh, absolutely, please. So I, I'll, I'll give the, the floor to Meg uh, and to um, Darlene. Anything I missed that you wanna throw in there, uh, you could go ahead. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Meg Walsh. Um, as Dr. Ball said, I was on the SBST team. So I worked primarily with the school psychologist and um, you know, and now I'm with the borough and, and I don't think you missed anything, Dr. Ball. I think this was a great overview. I think that the best word of advice so far is just work on that certification because it can be so time consuming. And I can speak personally that it almost, my, my ship almost sailed when, when Dr. Ball was turning at me in the board of ed and it was, it finally came through at the last minute, but the principal, the administrator, really possibly looking at having to go with someone else because I didn't have that paperwork. So, um, you know, I think that is the best word of advice right now, especially with all the new hires and um, it's a great opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I wish everyone the best of luck with it because, you know, being hired and having this experience is amazing. Thanks, Meg. Darlene. Hi everyone. Um, so as Dr. Ball mentioned, I have been in this field with him, not with him, but started with him in 2013. Um, what I'll say to you that this is the time to be in schools and this yeah. is the time for, for social workers to be in schools. The opportunities are there and they're endless. Um, so I just to piggyback what Meg said, um, follow through with those certifications, make those outreach, just make sure you're doing everything you can because the opportunities um, are, 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 are prime right now. I've never seen school social work the way that, that, I, that I'm seeing it now. We're finally getting recognized for all the work and abilities yeah. that we have. It feels really good to just kind of see the, the education world and the social emotional world merge. All right. Okay, we're out of time now. Dr. Roger Ball, you have done it again. So <laughs> I cannot thank you enough. You know, I, I heard so many wonderful, wonderful things, not just only how to apply, but that paperwork process, I heard you say patience. So you have to hang in there. Um, but if you compare the average salary for a graduate social work, um, for a graduate social worker just getting out of social work school in this tri-state area is 52,000. I heard you say tonight, you start at 72,000 in, in the Department of Education. But I heard over and over um, Dr. Ball saying, be proactive, understand when you go into an interview, while you're here in school, the development of that professional identity, you are becoming licensed professionals. So really developing that identity and being proactive before the interview. And you do that, you start that right now, even by being here tonight. I really want to applaud, there were so many of you here tonight. And I wish you all the best. We are here for you, Dr. Ball, you're the best. And um, maybe we'll have him back next semester and we'll talk about another, some other aspects of school social work. But thank you. I know some of you um, asked for the PowerPoint. 
Um, Fordham is now, there are classes tomorrow, but it's now closed. The staff, everybody's gone except for us chickens <laughs> until um, after the holiday. But Roger, if you send me that PowerPoint, students can come to um, myself and my assistant, Caitlin Toro, and we'll make sure anybody who wants it gets it. Darlene, are you able to drop it in the chat? Are we allowed to? Is, it, is that? Oh, a, sure. A, go ahead. Go right ahead. Darlene, could you tr see if you could drop it in the chat, Darlene? Let's just let's just release it right now. And if I just may give a, a, a my concluding one sentence, uh, please, Linda. please do. One, one. I am fiercely. It's a mission for me. You know, it's like a it's it's like my calling. It's a mission. I want to, I want to put you in public education. I want to hire you. I want to direct you. I want to mentor you. I want you to get to some terrible social work, you know, experiences in some of our schools. Because let's be honest, some of some of it is cray cray, right? Like some of them is like some serious stuff going on in public education. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, you know, put paint it as though it's all. It's there's some really awful things happening out um, there. The but go in there. To yeah, you know, but go in there. So I want to, you know, give you. So if you are a current student and you're looking to be placed, Siobhan, if I may throw you out there for a second, Siobhan is going to be joining us. But you know, and their folks are putting up in there. So if you're very, very serious about it, as Dr. White Ryan said, reach out to your folks at Fordham and let them reach out to me. And I guarantee you, I have a spot today for you. Right? I have a spot today for you. So, so that's one thing. Reach out for your internship if you're interested. And then secondly, you know, um, continue to develop yourself professionally. Continue to develop yourself professionally. And you know, the sky is the limit. All right, I think they just dropped, my team just dropped it in there. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah, I may see you on campus again. See you online. See you in your internship. See you in the streets, wherever I see you, right? Future and the possibilities are truly endless. Oh, and yeah. if, if you have done some other work, I forgot to say this, uh, Dr. White Ryan, if, you, if they've done some, let's say they've worked in charter school or they've worked in some other spaces, the deal will credit you five up to five years of public education or private education work towards your, your salary. So for example, when I started in the DOE, I didn't start at ground zero at the bottom level. I started as though I was there five years already. So that will probably put you right now at maybe eighty-five, eighty-seven thousand um, dollars If you have previous experience, the deal will accept those experiences and bump your salary up um, to much, much higher. They'll give you a maximum of five years, just so you know. Okay, everyone. We, Dr. Bull, thank you. And you gave us extra time. I'm so grateful to you always. You are a friend and a colleague. And thank you. This was amazing. I learned so much. Thank you.